Hello everyone, welcome to this lecture. So today we'll be starting off our KVPY series with maths and the topic of discussion is going to be polynomials, equations and inequations. I'm sure all of you are excited because KVPY is just around the corner and it is right time to start our preparation. So guys, today I have brought some really interesting and intriguing questions which will help you to enhance your concepts, okay? So we'll start discussing them. But before that, let me introduce myself as many of you may not be knowing me. So my name is Shimon Joseph and I'm a master teacher here at Vedantu. I've been teaching for almost six years now, mentoring over 5,000 amazing students like all of you. Like uh, you guys, I also prepared for IIT, KVPO and all these exams and I cleared them. So that is a quick intro. Now let us see what we are here for. And guys, many of you may not be aware of this series that we have started because this is the first class. I would like to show the schedule of this. So for the essay stream, essay stream means those who are in 11th standard, that is 10th moving to 11th students. For you guys, this is the schedule for this week, that is from August 5th to August 11th. Okay. So topics are math, physics, chemistry and your bio as well because KVPY in 11th standard has bio as a compulsory subject to attend. So even if you are a computer science student, you need to be aware of certain concepts in biology in order to score a good mark. Okay guys, so we are helping you in that aspect as well. So please do make a note of it and press the notification icon so that you will be notified whenever a video is out. Okay, awesome guys, perfect. This is for the 12th standard students. So this is the SX stream, which is meant for 12th standard students. I know some of you might be in 12th standard, just wanting to know what is happening in 11th. So for you guys, this is the schedule for this week. And as you can see, it'll be starting off from tomorrow, that is 6th of August with maths and goes on with physics, chemistry and bio, just like the 11th. Now you guys, if you are from PCM stream, that is engineering background, you need not attend the biology lecture because it is a not a mandatory subject to attend, clear? But if you are a student who is preparing for NEET and if your favorite subject is physics, chemistry and biology, then you can go and attend this biology lecture. It will be helpful for you guys as well. Okay? Perfect guys. Let's move forward. Now, before we get into the lecture, I know you guys are really excited to get into problem solving. But before that, if you want to connect with us, all the faculties at Vedantu and all the academic mentors who can guide you through your journey of IITJE preparation and KVPI preparation, Please do join this link. This is a telegram link. You can post your doubts, you can post questions, you can interact with your peers as well. So there are lots of benefits. You can talk to teachers, you can talk to your peers, you can talk to academic mentors who can guide you in the journey. Clear guys? So if you're interested, please do check out and we would like to have you on board. Okay. Now, guys, if you want this to spread to all your friends, do like, share and subscribe to our channel. With that, let's start off with the first question. The first question for you is right on your screen. And as you guys can see, this was a question which was asked in KVPY 2007. So I am going to give you all KVPY questions because you need to understand what are the type of questions they're asking. Is it too difficult or is it too easy? And what are the concepts they are testing? Is it very similar to NCRT or is it similar to IIT JE? So all that you need to understand, right? Because we are so used to NCRT, we are so used to IIT JE preparation. But KVPY is a different exam. You need to realize that. Let us look at why it is different. And guys, let me tell you one more thing. The first question is a pretty simple one. I started off from the simplest of questions and I'll end it on a high note. Okay? So you guys know what to expect. Let us start solving this question. I'll give you one minute time. If you guys get the answer, post it in your comments. I'll be there checking it out. Let's see who gets it right first. Okay. The set of real numbers are satisfying this inequality is what? So this is an inequation. I hope all of you understand that. Now there are certain values for R for which this will be satisfied. I want to get the collection of all of these R's. That is what they're asking. Pretty easy. Okay, because quadratic by quadratic inequality is very easy to solve. If you know something called as wavy curve method. I hope all of you know wavy curve. So that is a hint which I've given you. Now try to work on that and let me know what is the answer. Okay. Let us go ahead guys. Let's go ahead and see what is the answer for this. I think some of you might have answered already. Let's look at the answer. So we have option D, which is the right one. What does it say? It says that the set of all real numbers, which are either less than one or greater than five by three. Now we will try to solve it step by step and understand how this question works and how is it unfolding? That is the art you have to learn guys. Okay. 
very simple again. Some of you might feel, sir, did this really come in KVPI? Because it looks very easy. And guys, that came in 2007. Nowadays, it's of good standard. I will come to that in a while. Okay, perfect. So let me take the writing equipment. Okay, we have it over here. Let me move this around. And this is a question, right? 3R square minus 8R plus 5. So guys, if you are someone who cleared 10 standard, you must be very well aware of the fact that this numerator can be factorized. How do you factorize a numerator? It is very easily done because I can split the middle term. Something which I learned in my lower class and very obvious because 3 into 5 is 15 and 15 can be split with the sum of 8. Obviously you can do it. How do you do it? Minus 3 and minus 5, isn't it? So let me write that down for you. So I can write the numerator as 3R square minus 3R minus 5R plus 5. This is my numerator. Okay. So how does it factorize? I'm sorry for the double color. I think I should probably take one color. That's better. So this is going to be 3R common. You'll have R minus 1 minus 5 times of R minus 1. Okay. So it, it separates as 3R minus 5 times of R minus 1. Is that clear guys? Pretty easy. So the now numerator became like this. Now let us analyze the denominator and see if something similar can be done. Because if something similar is done to the new denominator as well, I can very easily use something called as wavy curve method. Because if I have all linear factors as a product and as division, I can easily use wavy curve. And if you guys are not aware of wavy curve, this is not the right place to do it. I would recommend you to go and refer a textbook. Okay, so let's get started. What do we have here in the denominator? I again have a quadratic equation. So I'm very happy because quadratic I've been learning right from 9th, 10th and even in 11th I've done it. So I have good confidence in that. Okay, so let's see how do I reduce it. So 4R square minus 3R plus 7. So first thing I analyze is my A that is coefficient of the leading term. What is the leading term here? R square is the leading term because it has a degree. And now that leading terms coefficient is 4, which is positive. So 4 is positive. So it is an upward opening parabola. And now I want to analyze the nature of roots. Because just by looking at the coefficient of x square, that is r square, and by knowing the nature of roots, I can predict how the graph will be, whether it will be always above the x-axis or intersecting the x-axis at two points or intersecting the x-axis at only one point. That is what I mean by analyzing the graph of a quadratic. Okay, so now let me take the discriminant. What is the discriminant? b square minus 4ac, which I'm sure all of you are aware of, isn't it? Now b square minus 4ac is what? 9 minus 4 times of 4 into 7. And guys, can you clearly see that this 9 minus 4 into 4 into 7 is going to be negative. That is less than 0. So since my discriminant is less than zero, I have imaginary roots. So whenever you have imaginary roots with the leading coefficient positive, how does the graph look like? Let me just plot a random graph. It looks something like this. It looks something like this, is it not? Because it is above the x-axis, meaning there is no real root. You are going to have imaginary roots. Why? Because my discriminant is less than zero. Next, since my A is positive, it is an upward opening parabola, isn't it? So therefore, I am going to have this quadratic to be always positive. So I know in this inequation, my denominator is always positive. Isn't it? My denominator is always positive. So if I want the overall thing to be always positive, I just need to realize or I just need to find out whether my numerator is always positive. So if my numerator is always positive, it is taken care of because you have numerator by denominator. Denominator is always positive. Overall also I want it to be positive. So that indirectly means I should just solve for my numerator being positive. That's it. As simple as that. Can you believe it? So how easy it has become now just by a few seconds of analysis. And guys, this should be done very fast. So right now I explain it to you each, each step. So it took some time, but in exam, you have to be pretty fast with this. Okay, that comes with time. Don't worry about it. So now let's solve this question. This I hope all of you can do it because it's direct wavy curve. How do you do wavy curve? You plot the number line and then you plot both the roots. Which is the lower root? One is the lower root and the other root is 5 by 3. Okay. So now the wavy curve, since both the coefficients are positive, 
I will start from the right hand side and since they have linear odd power, I will keep changing the direction. It will go zigzag, right? So it will be plus, it will be minus, it will be plus. So what are we looking at? We are looking at positive. Positive means plus region. So what is the plus region? It is nothing but minus infinity comma plus 1 union 5 by 3 comma infinity. And do we have that as the answer? Yes. Can you see that? The set of all real numbers which are either less than 1 or greater than 5 by 3. Perfect. We got the right answer. I hope all of you have got it. Yes, we took a lot of time, but it's good guys. It's good to learn such basics. So shall we move forward? I hope all of you are on online or on sync with me. With that, let's go ahead. If you guys want to redo it, please watch the recording again. It's beneficial. Okay. Let us go forward now. So this is the next question. Again, I can give you only 30 seconds guys because it's a very small lecture. I hope you guys will cooperate with me on that. Okay. Don't feel that I'm not giving you time. It's just because we have a short lecture. So this is a question, let me read it out for you. The polynomial p of x when divided by x square minus 3x plus 2 leaves a reminder of 2x minus 3. Then which of the following is true? Okay, you guys have to analyze that. Again, it's a very good question on polynomials wherein you have to focus on analyzing what is given to you and use what you have learned in lower classes. Because KVPY 11 standard syllabus is what you have studied up to 10th only. So don't worry about learning the 11th concepts to a greater level. Just focus on your 10th to a decent level. That's enough. Okay. Perfect. So let me just give you 20 seconds to be fair. And then I'll get started. And I'm sure all of you would have answered by now. So let us get going guys. Let's get going. So the answer for this question is going to be what? It's going to be option A. So let us look at why it is option A, which is the right one and why not the others. Okay. So let's try to analyze it guys. So here the concept that I'll be using to solve this question is going to be called as Euclid's division algorithm. And guys, it is very, very, very important for KVPY. Especially when you talk of polynomials, there can't be anything other than Euclid's division lemma that can be asked so frequently in an exam like KVPY. Okay. So let us look at what is Euclid's division lemma. So Euclid's division algorithm you must have studied in lower classes in 10th right now I will use that for polynomials so what it says is it says okay it says that when you have any polynomial p of x okay now I am dividing this polynomial by let's say d of x d of x okay d meaning divisor whenever you divide by something you call that number as divisor right so I am dividing by divisor of x which is again a polynomial so when I divide one polynomial by another, I get something called as quotient polynomial. I get something called as quotient polynomial. And this is only true if it is directly divisible. But if I am having something which is not directly divisible, you will have something called as reminder polynomial. So this is called as Euclid's division algorithm extended to polynomials. Okay guys. Now P of X, when I divide by D of X, I get quotient plus reminder. Clear? Now, the very, very crucial thing to note here is the reminder's degree, degree will be one less than my divisor. Divisor is what? D of X. That means if I have a quadratic here, my reminder can at the maximum be a linear polynomial. Are you guys able to follow? Let me give you a very simple example guys. Let me give you a very simple example. So let's say I divide 11 by 5. So how do I write it? I write it as 11 is equal to 2 into 5 plus 1. Getting it? I write 11 as 2 into 5 plus 1. I am explaining with numbers because you guys can correlate to it very easily. Okay. Now the same thing. Can I write it like this? 1 into 5 plus 6. Does that make sense? How can my reminder be greater than the divisor? That is absolutely not allowed. You cannot have your reminder greater than your divisor, right? That is why I need to make sure it is 2 into 5 plus 1. So that my 1, that is my reminder is always lesser than 5. Getting it? Are you all clear? So that same logic is extended there. So the degree of my reminder polynomial should always be 1 less than my degree of divisor. Okay. Now, is it always necessary for it to be 1 less than? 
No, it can be two less than, it can be three less than, it can be four less than, but at the maximum, it can be one less than the divisor. I hope that's clear now. Very good concepts. Please make a note of it if you haven't. Okay. So guys, I need to erase it. I hope that's fine with you. If you want to make a note, please pause the video and look at it. I'm going to erase it. Perfect. Let me solve it now. So here we have P of X and now it will be very simple for you. So you guys can try it along with me. I want everyone to try. Okay. Because I've given you the theory. I've given you the concept. You guys can rock it. I'm sure. Okay. So it is divided by this one. So this is what? This is my divisor polynomial. Okay. So divisor polynomial will come here x square minus 3x plus 2 okay into q of x what is q of x q of x is my quotient of which i have no idea absolutely whatsoever because my p of x is not given right they didn't say anything about p of x so how will i know my quotient there is no way you can know this okay q of x is absolute mystery only god knows what it is okay so now let's move forward and write the reminder what is the reminder reminder is 2x minus 3 okay Perfect. I hope all of you have got this step. This is P of X, a polynomial which is written as divisor into quotient plus reminder. Perfect. Very easy. Directly fit into that Euclid's division algorithm. Now, let us solve it. Now, I want to know what is P of 1. Why do I calculate P of 1? Guys, I just want to know what is the sign of P of 1 and what is the sign of P of something else so that if they are of opposite sign, so if let's say 1 is here and let's say some other number let's say 2 so 1 is negative and 2 is positive that means obviously between 1 and 2 there will be a root obviously between 1 and 2 there is a root I am trying to use this logic over here because I can calculate p of 1 you can ask me sir how sir how can you calculate p of 1 when you don't know q of x how can you go and calculate p of 1 but guys think about it when I put 1 right this will become 0 so, 0 into q of x, q of 1 will anyway take it forward, right? 0 into q of 1 will make it 0. So, whatever q of 1 is, I have no idea. But luckily for me, this becomes 0, na? So, it makes it 0. So, I will have 2 into 1 minus 3, which is minus 1. So, p of 1, like I said here, is actually negative. Is actually negative. Now, let me try p of 2. How do I get p of 2? How do I guess I should put 1 and 2? Because look at this. Factorize this and see. This is nothing but x minus 1 into x minus 2. Nah? So if I substitute 1 and 2, I know that my q of x will be gone. And that is something which I want, right? So if I put 2 also, it will be 0 into q of 2 plus 2 into 2 minus 3, which is plus 1. That's it. So I know p of 2 is plus 1. p of 1 is minus 1. Obviously, there has to be a root between 1 and 2. Why? Because all polynomials are continuous functions, so they have to cross that point. That is a property of continuous functions, which you guys might learn in 12th standard, so don't worry about it. Polynomials are continuous. You can take it as a fact. Okay, good. So I hope all of you have understood it. So that is why the answer is P of X must have a root between 0 and 3. So pakka between 0 and 3, you will have a root. And that is why 1 and 2, right? Obviously, 1 and 2 is between 0 and 3. So, it's the right answer. Clear? So, shall we move forward? All of you, I hope you have got it. I'm going to erase it. And then move ahead to the next one. And guys, if I'm blocking the view, please do let me know. So, that I'll... From the next video, at least I'll stand in the corner. Okay. Let's go ahead. Next question. Let's, let's go, go faster, guys. Because we have a... Lot of questions to cover, but very less time. So if you guys can work faster, do let me know in the comments and in the chat so that I can bring more such nice questions for you. Okay. So again, this question, let me give you a hint after probably 20 seconds. Right now, I want those who sincerely want to try it to try it out. So here, A, B and C are three distinct numbers. Very, very important. They have to be distinct because otherwise the denominator doesn't make sense. Otherwise, the denominator will become 0, right? They have to be distinct. Okay. And let P of X be so and so. Now, when simplified, what does P of X become? So, this question, you might think, sir, very easy, sir. Take LCM and then solve it fully, sir. But it will take tomorrow for you to complete. Getting it? So, you need to find some simpler way to do it. So, this is not a tough question because anyone can do it if I give them time. 
Just take LCM, open everything, cancel everything. Finally, you'll get the answer. Okay. But think of a method which might give you the answer in less than probably 30 seconds. Yeah. Try to do that. And I will give you a hint now. The hint is you need to know what is the difference between an equation and an identity. I'm sure your maths teacher in 10th standard would have told this. Students, equation and identity are not the same. Identity means what? It is satisfied for all values of x. But equations are satisfied only for certain values of x, isn't it? So now think on those lines and try to attack this question. Okay guys, perfect. So let's see who gets it right. I think some of you might have already and kudos to them. Great job. I'll just give you 10 more seconds and then move on to the answer and see how it is done. It's basically what I just said. So the answer for this question, surprisingly guys, it's not B, it's not C, it's not D. It is option A. Okay, so this big expression which you see over here is actually 1. Can you believe that? Let us see how it works. Okay, because we are interested in that alone. Now guys, can you agree that we have P of X to be a quadratic? Are you all accepting that fact? Because look at it, my denominator does not contain any X. My numerator contains X. Getting it? So my denominator has nothing related to do with X. So whatever I get, I get it from the numerator. And numerator is two linear factors multiplied together, which will give me nothing but a quadratic. So I can say very comfortably, when I add quadratic plus quadratic plus quadratic, I will still be ending up with a quadratic only. So my P of X is a quadratic polynomial. That is the first thing you observe when you open this question or when you try to unfold it. Getting it? So as soon as I know that my P of X is going to be a quadratic equation, I'm, bi I'm a bit confident now because quadratic is something which all of us are comfortable with. Okay, now let's try to solve it. So guys, the way we solve it is pretty interesting. Have a look at it. So let's try to solve this question. So I will say my P of X is equal to so and so. Okay. So let me not just write it down because it's too big. I will take a new polynomial f of x as p of x minus 1. Okay. Now let's observe what is f of a. Guys, what is f of a? But before we get into f of a, what is f of x? Is it a quadratic again? It has to be a quadratic because my p of x is a quadratic. And if I subtract a constant from a quadratic, I will still end up with a quadratic only, right? So whatever I have here, my f of x is still going to be a quadratic equation. I will tell you why I introduced this. It is not necessary absolutely to introduce f of x. You can still solve it with p of x alone. But for some of you who want no confusion but only clarity, this is a better approach. And that is why I have chosen this. Okay. So guys, let's say what is f of a. Now what is f of a? f of a is nothing but p of a minus 1. Now, I just need to put A in this expression and get the answer done. Okay, let's do that together, shall we? So, if I put A here, I will get A minus B, A minus C. That's the same thing I have in denominator. So, both will get cancelled and I'll have 1 here. Let me repeat again. I'll have A minus B because instead of X, I'm putting A, right? So, I'll get A minus B times of A minus C which will cancel and I'll have 1 over here, isn't it? And if I put a here, it will be 0 because numerator, I have a minus a. So this will be 0. Similarly here also 0. So I will have 1 plus 0 plus 0 which is 1. So p of a is 1 minus 1 will be 0. So can I say my a is a root of f of x? Can I say my a is a root of f of x by factor theorem? Yes. If a is a factor, x minus a is a factor of any polynomial, then if I substitute that, it should be giving me 0 as the value, isn't it? So I can say a is a root of f of x. Similarly, if you observe f of b, that will also be 0. You can do it yourself. So can I say b is also root of f of x? And guys, please keep in mind, your f of x is a quadratic. Because p of x is quadratic, I subtracted 1 from p of x. So when you subtract a constant from p of x, you are going to end up with a quadratic only, right? It's not going to change much. So f of x is quadratic. Already I got two roots. But wait a minute. I still didn't go to c at all, right? What is c? 
f of c is what? f of c is p of c minus 1 which is again 0. Now I am thinking, my teacher has taught me that a quadratic can have at the most 2 roots only. Then how is this having 3 roots? 3 roots is not possible, right? Because I am pakka sure that my f of x is a quadratic. That is because your f of x is not an equation, it is an identity. That's it. So your f of x is always 0. So f of x is always 0, which means my p of x minus 1 is always 0. So p of x has to be 1. That's it. Over. As simple as that. Did you guys get it? So the logic is, here you have f of x as a quadratic, right? A quadratic can have only two roots, guys. And here, when I put f of a, f of b and f of c, I'm getting all of them to be simultaneously zero. How can I have three roots for a quadratic? That makes me thinking, right? So then I recollect that, there is something called equation and there is something called as identity. So identity can have as many roots as possible because whatever you put is going to be satisfied. So here, the f of x we have is not actually a quadratic equation, rather it's an identity. So my f of x is always zero and that is why my p of x minus one is zero because f of x is p of x minus one, right? So it implies that my p of x also is an identity which is one. Getting it? Clear? So shall we move forward? Everyone fine with it? Good question, right? Perfect guys. So let us go ahead and see some more. I brought some really interesting ones for you. Please do watch it if you didn't get it again. Okay. So next question for all of you is right over here. Brilliant one. So guys, there are five real numbers. Let's say x1, x2, x3, x4, x5. And they all obey this equation. Now, if they obey this equation, I want you to find the value of x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 plus x5 by 2. That is what I want you to find. And this was asked in 2008. It's a very good question. Okay. And some of you might know how to solve it. Just think about it. Give it a try for 20 seconds. I will tell you the approach. And guys, again, sorry for the less time because we need to cover some ground. That's the only reason. Okay. Perfect. Maybe you can pause it and then do it. That'll be fine. You can maybe pause it and then join me later on. That'll be good for you. Okay. So let's move forward. Let's look at the answers. I know some of you might have already given a try and answered it. If someone got B option, brilliant guys, very good job. That's the right answer. So B is the correct answer. Let's see how to solve this question. Okay. So guys, this is a very lengthy question. So I'm not going to take every term. I'll just tell you by taking only the first term. Okay. I can't solve completely. It's a very lengthy question, right? So let me just take the first term. So what I do basically is, I start off with this expression because that is what is given to me, isn't it? So I start off with this given expression and what I do is I multiply this 2 to the left hand side. Okay. So it's better I write it down because I don't want to confuse you guys. Maybe I'll write it down. So what do I have? I have 2 root x1 minus 1 and then what do I have? Plus this 2 is coming to the left hand side, right? So 2 into 2 will become 4. So 4 root x2 minus 4 plus 6 root x3 minus 9 plus 8 root x4 minus 16 plus 10 root x5 minus 25 is equal to x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 plus x5. Okay. So now what I'll do is I'll take all of these to the other side. Okay. So all this, I am taking to the right hand side and that I am writing now in the left, okay. So let me write it down, it will be x1 minus 2 root of x1 minus 1, first term, then x2 minus 4 root of x2 minus 4, getting it? Are you getting the hang of it? It's pretty interesting, the way you do it, okay. The next term will be x3 minus 6 root of x3 minus 9, okay, and the next one is x4 minus 8 times of root of x4 minus 16 plus x5 minus 10 times of root of x5 minus 25 equal to 0. Now, look at it carefully. I'll do some manipulation here. So, can I write this x1 as, 
can I write this x1 as, wait a minute, let me erase it carefully so that I don't, I'll write this x1 as x1 minus 1 plus 1. Okay. What is the beauty of it? This x1 minus 1, can I write it as root of x1 minus 1 whole square? Now do you see what I did? Now do you all understand? What did I do? x1 was there. I wrote it as x1 minus 1 plus 1. Okay. First thing. Then x1 minus 1, I wrote it as root of x1 minus 1 whole square. Why? Because then these three combined will be what? will be root of x1 minus 1 minus 1 whole square. Do you see that? That is the beauty of this question. Likewise, you can reduce every term, guys. Likewise, you can reduce every term. So next, what will I do? x2 is there. No, I will subtract 4. I will add 4. Okay. So what will happen? This will become x1, I'm sorry, x2 minus 4 root whole square plus 4 minus 4 times of root of x2 minus 4. So that will reduce as root of x2 minus 4 plus 2, I'm sorry, not plus 2, minus 2, minus 2 whole square. Did you all get it? Are you able to see that? So root x2 minus 4 whole square is what? x2 minus 4 plus 2 square is plus 4 minus 2ab. Are you all able to see that? The same way, I can continue this as well. So this will be what? Root x3 minus 9 minus 3 whole square. Next one will be plus root x4 minus 16 minus 4 whole square. Plus root x5 minus 25 minus 5 whole square equal to 0. They are all real numbers, right? They are all real numbers. How can the squares of all the real numbers add to give 0? How can the squares of all real numbers add to give 0? Only possible when each of them is 0. Only possible when each of them is 0. So what does that mean? That means root of x1 minus 1 is equal to 1. So what is x1? x1 is equal to 2. That's it. Now root of x2 minus 4 is equal to 2. So what is x2? x2 is equal to 8. Getting it? So what will be x3? x3 minus 9 is equal to 9. So x3 is equal to 18. That's it over. What is x4? x4 minus 16 is equal to 16. So x4 is equal to 32. What is x5? x5 is equal to 50. Because 50 will give you the answer, right? 0. That's it. So now add them up. What is that? 2 plus 8 plus 6, uh, 18, right? 18 plus 32 plus 50 divided by 2. That's it. Divide by 2 and tell me the answer. No, what is that? 1 plus 4 plus 9 plus 16 plus 25. It's a sum of first 5 squares. So it is what? 5 into 6 into n into n plus 1 into 2n plus 1 by 6. Answer is 55. That's it. Done. Over. I hope you guys are getting it. Good question. All of you liked it. So guys, that is how you solve it. I hope all of you have understood it. I know it's a lot of solving and it might be clustering over here. So please go through it step by step. You will get it because it is basic algebra only. I'm just collecting terms. And what is my main intent? My main intent is to express it as squares. Sum of squares, if they are zero, obviously, each of them has to be zero only when it is real numbers. Okay, please understand you have, you have to realize that it is only true for when you're talking about real numbers, not always because when you're having complex numbers, sum of two squares can be zero and still both of them need not be zero. Okay, perfect. So guys, I hope it's clear. Go through it. Probably I'll move a bit back, take a screenshot, go through it and let me know if you have any trouble in this. Okay, perfect. So yeah, let me move on to the next question. The so next and the final question for all of you is over here. This is the last one and I chose it at the end because it's a pretty brilliant question. Okay, so let us have a look at it guys. So what do we have here? You have a polynomial P of X is equal to 1 plus X plus X square plus X cube and so on all the way up to X power 5. Now what is the reminder when P of X power 12 is divided by P of X? 
Now guys, I've already given you a hint today's class. Whenever you have polynomials, reminders, divided, what do you think of? You have to think of Euclid's division algorithm. That is the hint I'll give you. 30 seconds and then I'm going to discuss this and with that we might conclude our class. Okay? Perfect. So try to give it a try. Let's solve it and uh, then we will discuss it. And please do keep me posted in the comments guys. Do let do comment whatever you want to do or if you didn't understand any question, let me know in the comment. I will try to help you out by explaining it further. Okay? Good. So guys, uh, the answer for this, as some of you might have already said, I'm sure, is going to be, any idea? Any guesses? You guys can quickly comment it down. What do you think will be the answer? The answer for this question is again, surprisingly, not C, not D, it is not A as well, it is option B, okay? So option B is the correct answer for this question. Let's see how it is done guys. It's a brilliant question. That's why I kept it to the last. It's a very good question. Quite unique. So let's try to see how to solve it and learn something new. So guys, here P of X to the power 12 is what I divide with P of X. Okay, so if this is my polynomial, this is my divisor. So divisor into quotient plus reminder. Okay. Is that clear? So now I just need to find my reminder. That is the question. Okay. Are you all aware of it? Now my P of X is what? My P of X is a fifth degree polynomial. My P of X is fifth degree. Isn't it? Are you all able to acknowledge that? Because look at it guys. It's a clear polynomial. It's a very clear polynomial, right? Very clear. It can't get more clearer than that. So here, as you can see, the degree is 5. What is degree? Degree is the highest power of a polynomial. And highest power here is 5. So this is 5th degree. So now, I have taught you Euclid's division algorithm. What does it say? It says that my R of X can be at the most 4th degree. Okay. So at most 4th degree. Isn't it? Perfect. So at the most, R of X can be 4. All these you have to keep in mind. Now, let's analyze P of X further. Let's analyze P of X further. Now, one thing which you, you guys must have noticed is, some of you would have guessed, I'm pakka sure. I'm very sure because all my students say the same. Sir, this is GP, sir. Isn't it? I'm sure some of you have done it. Okay, so this P of X is absolutely a GP. You guys are right on the dot. So let's try to use the GP formula and reduce it and see what happens. Because when you use the GP formula, right, you'll get some new insights. I want you guys to realize that, okay? So let's take some new insights. What do we have here? So this will be 1 minus x to the power 6 by 1 minus x. Is that correct? A into 1 minus r to the power n by 1 minus r. Yeah, that's correct. Isn't it? So this is the GP formula. Now what does this say? This says that the roots of p of x are the roots of p of x are let's say alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, alpha 4, alpha 5, which are the sixth roots of unity. Which chapter did we study this? Which chapter did we study this? We studied this in complex numbers. For example, z to the power 6 minus 1 equal to 0. These roots are nothing but the roots of p of x. These roots are nothing but the roots of p of x. Are you guys able to follow? Are you getting it? So this and this are basically the same. But the only difference is here for p of x, 1 is not a root. Obviously, you can put 1 here, right? 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 6. How can that be 0? 6 is not 0, right? So I know that 1 is not a root. So what we are looking at is the 6 roots of unity except 1. Except 1. Are you guys able to follow? Do you all realize that? So if I put alpha 1 here, it will be 0. If I put alpha 2 here, it will be 0. If I put alpha 3 here, again 0. Because they are all 6 roots of unity. Alpha 1 to the power 6 is what? is 1. If this is 6th root of unity, alpha 1 to the power 6 is 1. So 1 minus 1 is what? 0, right? 
so p of x will have roots as alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha 3 alpha 4 alpha 5 which are nothing but the five other roots of unit other sixth sixth root of unity apart from one because sixth root of unity there are six in number right what are they one alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha 3 alpha 4 alpha 5 but i know one is not a root of p of x and that is rightly so because p of x is having degree 5 right it should have only five roots so one is not a root getting it perfect awesome so now this is the background now you'll understand why i spoke a lot <laughs> okay you need to know a lot only then you can come here and solve it okay so let me erase it shall i guys please make a note of it i'm going to erase it let's erase it quickly and then move forward okay why is the eraser so small okay oh what did i do perfect good so guys let me write it down again this is fourth degree maximum at most at most okay so now back to same logic what is the same logic in the previous question under euclid's division algorithm what did i use for substituting values here for substituting values here what did i do i put the roots of p of x you remember what did we have in the previous question we had x square minus 3x plus 2 you remember in today's class x square minus 3x plus 2 i took the roots of that what are the roots of that 1 and 2 and then i substituted it here remember that right same logic what are the roots of p of x alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha 3 alpha 4 alpha 5 so let me put p of alpha 1 p of alpha 1 power 12 is equal to what p of alpha 1 q of alpha 1 plus r of alpha 1 okay are you guys able to follow now what is r of this will be zero right this will be zero because alpha 1 is a root of p of p of x so root means what when i substitute that value it will give me zero so this will be zero so r of alpha 1 is equal to p of alpha 1 power 12 What is alpha one power twelve? It is one, because alpha one is the sixth root of unity. So alpha one power six is one. So alpha one power twelve will also be one only. Getting it? So p of one is what? P of one is equal to one plus one plus one plus one plus one plus one, which is six. So six is equal to r of alpha one. Getting it? Are you all clear? Now, what do you think will be r of alpha two? R of alpha two will also be six because alpha two power twelve will also be one. P of one we already know it's six. P of alpha two is again zero. So R of alpha two will also be six. R of alpha three will also be six. R of alpha four will also be six. R of alpha five will also be six. Now guys, similar to the previous question, how can I have five roots? Because Don't don't look at it as six. You guys might be thinking, sir, how is alpha one root of r, sir? What are you saying? Now think of it like that. Let's say I take take f of x like the previous question. I'll take it as r of x minus six. Now you'll understand. I'll take f of x as r of x minus six. Now, what is f of alpha one? Do you guys agree it's zero? Do you guys f of alpha two is also zero? Do you guys agree that f of alpha three is also zero? Alpha four is also zero. Alpha five is also zero. So f is going to have five roots. F is going to have five roots. What are the five roots? One alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, alpha four, alpha five. Okay. What is f of x? F of x is r of x minus six. Now r of x is a polynomial of degree four. Now r of x minus six is also going to be a polynomial of degree four only. Getting it? So when it has a degree four. How can you have five roots? That is not possible. So f of x has to be an identity, and what is that identity? F of x has to be zero. So if f of x is zero, then r of x will be six. That is how you solve it. Brilliant, right? It's a very very good question. I liked it. <laughs> okay. So I hope all of you are excited and you learn something great today. So guys, stay motivated. That is the biggest thing you have to have. in your two years of preparation and stay connected you can join our telegram group i would really like to interact with all of you 
and get to know more more questions discuss some really good ones and keep learning okay so guys this will be the last question i think i have already taken a lot of your time so let's get going so with that it's done okay we have one more probably you guys can take it as homework and post the solution guys this one you can take it as homework i'll probably edit out the solution slide i'm not going to show you what is the answer just take it as a homework and probably maybe in the next class i can do it or i will put it down in the comment box so take a screenshot and do it in the free time so guys one huge huge surprise announcement for all of you so those who are going to coaching classes those who are not free in the evenings who can't attend our kvpy regular course for you guys i have brought something really interesting and with the help of our management we have uh, launched a mock test series for all of you so this mock test series is very beneficial guys because it is going to be of the same pattern as kvpy which not many are aware of okay kvpy is a government exam so it's very hard to predict what will come up what to expect in the actual exam so if you want to get an hands on experience of it please do check out this course okay so i'll be sending you the course link tomorrow's class so please do watch out for that okay because this year the exam is online i'm sure all of you are aware of it so whenever you have an online experience it's beneficial so we have two part tests so we break the entire syllabus into two portions connect half of it half of it so that you can have a overall understanding of it and then three full tests and that should be enough because kvpi uses are three months right so five full tests five tests totally is good and the best part is the analysis so you get to write with almost all your peers across the country you can know where you are standing where you are lagging which areas your friends are scoring better than you so that analysis report will be given to you in our vedantu portal okay and guys it's available for a very very reasonable price it's just 1000 bucks you can check it out and i'll give you the course link definitely tomorrow so yeah this is the telegram group link please do join if you want to interact with all of us and as always like comment and subscribe that keeps us going i would really like to receive your comments and let me know what you felt could have been better any suggestions like tough tougher questions you can always let us know okay guys and keep please keep in touch meet me in the next class that is tomorrow till then take care bye bye see you in the next one guys